Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, family to Parent Power Hour, Monday, five o'clock. Thank you all for joining us again. Uh, as you can see, we have two esteemed guests as always, Miss mm -hmm. uh, Tiffany Catron and Miss Linnea Cornish. And tonight's topic will be about grading, uh, something that's very important to all of us uh, in the district. Uh, as students, as teachers, as parents. And as you can obviously see, our dear brother, uh, Brother Tyrone is not with us today. Uh, please send him your love and prayers. He's feeling a little bit under the weather as you know, the season is, uh, is definitely upon us. So um, please send in your love. And if you have his number, text him, let him know that you are uh, thinking about him. Family, our connection question, we're going to go to our um, esteemed guest first, but please, family, uh, go ahead and put it into the chat. Uh, Brother Tyrone, actually, though he's not here, is still sharing our live feed via Facebook and other platforms. The question is, are you an early bird or a night owl? And we're going to start with Miss Catron first. Uh, well... <laughs> I think um, lockdown and Corona has kind of like shifted that to, I don't know what I am anymore, but I would definitely say a night owl. I, I just, as much as I try, I haven't mastered the getting up early thing. So night owl. Understood. Understood. Ms. Cornish, how about you? Um, I can say that I am still a night owl. Um, however, um, because my second youngest likes to get up early, I have to become an early bird uh, for him. Uh, but other than that, um, I could sleep in and, and stay up late. Well, thank you both for sharing. Ms. Katron, I have to say I'm with you. I thought I knew who and what I was prior to, you know, the COVID situation. I was definitely an early riser. Now I, I don't know if I'm going or coming. So I'm a little bit of both. Uh, thank you all so much for sharing that. And family, please, um, if you would enter it in, are you an early bird or a night owl? Um, ladies, don't be afraid. If you see me do something like this, it is because you are dropping nuggets of wisdom. And it's a symbol that we use on our show. And you may hear from our family members, nuggets, nuggets, nuggets. That means you're saying something that resonates with myself, Tyrone, or uh, our family at home. So again, thank you so much for being here, uh, taking your time, being on screen certainly all day, but uh, joining us uh, to talk about the podcast um, and grading. Very important, and, and it seems now that there's an emphasis, uh, not only in Baltimore, but in society as a whole with schooling, and all, it seems all the aspects of schooling are under a microscope because of what has happened to our nation. Um, and on the show, uh, the parents and, and concerned stakeholders have been talking about, and I, I've kind of coined this, that the district and everybody in the district needed an IEP for what they were going through on all phases, you know, um, to try to reestablish some normalcy. There had to be some kind of leniency some academic leniency, um, as well as bolstering of safety protocols. But just speaking specifically um, about grading, uh, Ms. Cornish, I'm actually gonna come to you first and I know about um, all of your experience. I know it just says parent, but you are a parent and so much more than that. Um, but how does the, the grading system and protocols work in Baltimore City? And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a profound question because I think we don't really give it much thought. We just think, okay, kids do assessments or they turn in their work and there's a grade and, and that's, we don't think about the, the origins of it. Um, so, I mean, it, it's definitely a complex uh, process. Um, the, the district, possibly even um, the state, um, maybe even federally have some guidelines that of course that they push down um, and per the, the, the different LEAs, they pretty much make the determination of how they want to um, govern, you know, their grading policy. Um, for at least for Baltimore City, um, there was a revision um, 
I want to say in 2019, but do not quote me, but there was a re revision with their grading policy, which often, you know, we end up hearing about it later on. You know, I remember when the, the notion of the 60%, like people were like, well, wait a minute, you know, where did 60% come in the, for the fact that, you know, that's like, acceptable. Um, but we always kind of hear about it, you know, after the fact. And that was kind of, I want to say my, my preview of what today's grading policy was. I don't recall it coming to me any earlier than after the fact. Um, so now, you know, um, the heavy piece of it, the heavy lift is that our children are um, assessed, there, any assessment that the children um, encounter through their uh, quarters or through their um, daily schedule is worth 70%. Um, I believe the summative is about 20% if you wanna break it down and formative assessments are worth 50%. Um, so I do remember when I think last year when school started, you know, it, it was brought to everyone's attention. Um, and then they also discussed how, because they were making that change, they also discussed how reassessment was a part of the grading policy. So if in all, you know, any child is assessed using that 50 or that 20% um, grading criteria, um, if for whatever reason the children fall short of maybe what either the teacher's expectation is for the child or maybe the parent expectation for the child, uh, there is an opportunity for both parties to come together, discuss, and decide if a reassessment is, um, out, uh, is allowed at this point or is applicable for this particular child. Um, you know, so again, I think for me it was you know, I mean, I'm not saying that for me, you know, 70% or the criteria um, isn't right. Um, I just think for me, it was, I just wasn't aware of it as a parent that there was real, a real discussion around it. Um, and then I really haven't heard about the research behind it. You know, what's the difference between a child, um, you know, the grading policy for an assessment being 50%, you know, is it 20%, you know, just like what, what have been the best practices, you know, throughout, you know, public schools or throughout different um, modalities of education, you know, why 70%? Um, so um, that's as much as I do know. Um, and then I know from the district, um, I think each school um, is, um, is able to frame what their policy is. And um, if you look on the website for Baltimore City Schools, it, it tells you very plainly, check out your school's grading policy. So it isn't just, I think what the district is saying, this has to happen. Um, they have given that allowance to schools, you know, so I just think as a parent, if I'm talking to other parents, you know, here on this call, I would say, ask your, ask your administration, you know, please, if it's not available, you know, on their website, can you please send me the grading policy? Thank you, and uh, nuggets for that. It's it's something that um, uh, born born out of not being informed. You know, certainly parents and uh, us as advocates have to ask the questions. Uh, Ms. Catron, from from your perspective, from your point of view, um, are teachers involved in uh, the creation of the grading policies? Um, Ms. Corners did speak to uh, each policy not being uniform. Um, throughout the district and, and that there are different ones in each school, but what's your perspective on, on the grading? So um, thank you, Ms. Corner. She kind of laid out uh, like a reference of it all. Um, it's actually 35% summative, 35% formative, 15 classwork and 15 participation in terms of the percentage breakdown. Um, and parents on the call, formative assessments are kind of like those quizzes as we go, if you will, um, just to kind of check in, hey, are the students grasping what, like what, what we're doing as we're going? Do they understand um, what we've done in lessons one through five in math so far, if you will? And then a summative assessment is more of like an end of the module or end of the unit assessment. Um, just summing it all up, basically. Did they understand what we did over this whole quarter or this whole module? Um, so looking at that breakdown, and Ms. Cornish, you're right, they started, at, um, well, at least it became transparent and was our expectation to grade in that way last year. So this is our second year with those new breakdowns. Um, 
And before that, I will say there was very minimal guidance. So I appreciate that there is some guidance and some structure. Um, and I also will have to agree that the autonomy, um, it's kind of scaffolded down. So the district has laid out, we want grades to fall into these, bu these buckets and these are the percentages. Um, now schools figure out what you want to fall within those categories. And if you look at the policy, it's kind of broken down in the language of um, different items or different things that teachers can do within a formative assessment, a summative assessment, what can be considered classwork and participation. So you're not only looking at um, a test or a quiz, but you can also look at, um, did you allow the students to maybe make a play? We're in the virtual world now. I have first graders turning in flip grids where they can answer me via a video. So um, there is a lot of teacher discretion involved. So I also appreciate that. However, that can become kind of fuzzy. So what do we grade? Is there uniformity across the city? Is there uniformity across um, different systems when it comes to what we're grading? Um, uh, of course, we have like end of module tasks and things like that. Teachers will incorporate as a, like a summative grade, but what are the other things that we are grading um, and how do they affect that grade? Because if we're looking at assessments or assessment like activities as 70% of someone's grade, is that a true picture of what that student knows? Because everyone has a different learning style and approach. So um, I appreciate that there's more guidance, but um, as an educator, I also feel a little fuzzy as to, I often ask questions or when I get in like a professional development setting, well, what did you grade? Or let me see some of your work. And Ms. Cornish is shaking her head because it's true. It's like, you kind of want to like, compare apples to oranges or apples to apples, figure out what's going on. So um, there's some appreciation and there's still some confusion um, with the policies um, as they stand. The autonomy is great, the school autonomy is great, but then again, when it trickles down to the, the teacher, um, we have to decide what we're grading. And I, don't, I just don't know, um, that's the part where it's like how fair is it when there's not a uniform system for that? Thank you, Ms. Katron. And I do have a follow-up, but before I get to that, let me welcome in our family that's joining us online. Uh, Patrick and Yasha, thank you so much. The awesome twosome, I should call you all for constantly tuning in and chiming in. So Patrick and Yasha are nocturnal. Uh, Michael Cheney, thank you, sir, for joining in, is both. This is kind of what Ms. Katron and myself were saying. We don't know if we're coming or going. Uh, Yaja says, wow, I didn't know this, this about the grading policy, given that the school have to use Common Core. And that's what we're talking about. Um, there is no uniformity. You may have uniformity in terms of percentages, but what those percentages are uh, made up from seems to me like a school choice type of situation. Uh, Ms. Katron, I wanted, to, I wanted to follow up because you kind of alluded to the differences uh, in how you're teaching now versus how you're in the classroom, how you're allowing your students to answer now versus how you're in the classroom. I don't know how uh, technically supported your classroom was before, but more than likely the students weren't using those grids to answer you. Um, when you were with them physically. So uh, given that, how have you kind of shifted to help the students, you know, uh, really embrace a different style of learning, a different style of response, a different style of listening to Ms. Ketron and, you know, working through my Zoom system um, and submitting my, my, uh, my classwork, my homework, and my assessments. So what I will say first is that um, from the very beginning of teaching, um, the universal design of learning, approaching learning in multiple ways, approaching learning with respect to the learner. Um, I've always provided multiple ways for students to be able to respond, um, for students to be able to do things, to show me what they know. Really, that's a chant in the class, show me what you know, show me what you know. And so it's, um, 
I've always provided multiple opportunities for that. And that's where perspective also comes in. The art of teaching is being able to um, pull that learning out of your students any way that they can give it to you. Not everybody has mastered that art and some people are trying really hard and other, others have got it. So um, there were multiple ways that I was allowing students when we were face-to-face -face in our normal setting to, um, to respond to me, to answer group work, charts. We do um, gallery walks, walking around, looking at different things. I'm working in a group with a partner, using computers. And yes, you're absolutely right. Um, I think we were way behind in the technological aspect because man, I, we just learned that through all of this. And is that teaching us some things that we need to take back into the classroom? Absolutely. Should we have caught on to that so late? No, but here we are. So um, now that we're looking at um, right now teaching 100% virtual, I know some districts have hybrid going on and there's some other things. Um, I'm using, again, that universal design of learning to make sure that not only am I allowing different styles of learning to express their learning to me, but I'm also paying homage to um, social, economical, psychological factors as well, because not everybody has the same utensils and tools right around them to be able to answer me in the same way. So if you're, we're faced, like I can see you on the Zoom call and if you can hold your answer up, if you can show your answer, if you can come on mute and speak your answer, if you know as a first grader, a kindergartner, a second grader, even higher grades, uh, how to access the link I drop in the chat box, then you can go and do that flip grid. Um, that's not easy for everybody. So if I grade you, Mr. Richardson, and you and Ms. Cornish the same way, because my only expectation is you do that flip grid and that's your grade for this assignment, that's not fair. Um, there's no equity in that because Ms. Cornish, she just doesn't know how to go to that link. She doesn't know how to do that, whereas Mr. Richardson, you do. So I allow and I allot for text messages, phone calls. I've done classwork with students via you know, FaceTime or Google Duo, whatever it is that I can provide for students to give me answers. Um, I've tried to create that space as much as possible because I'm noticing now, um, in person, I'm gonna get that work back because we're all in that environment and that's the expectation. Now that's the expectation in this environment, but I'm also not in a controlled environment. So um, just allowing multiple ways, teaching very explicitly and modeling these platforms that students can use. Um, and I think that that brings me to an important point for teachers. Um, we need to be very mindful when even when we're back to the norm of our expectation and how we get work back, because essentially that's what under the umbrella of the system we have to use to grade. Even though I'm looking at many factors, um, I still need that hardcore evidence. You mentioned like IEPs in the beginning and things like that. If I go because I really think that my student has a learning disability and needs an IEP to accommodate their learning and so I can see better grades, um, I need hardcore data. I can't just go and say, well, in my teacher opinion, Miss Cornish, she can give me her letter sounds or she can tap these words out or she can add her numbers. They want hardcore data. So under the umbrella of it all, um, we still have to have that work, that tangible work too. I hope that answered. It it did. Thank you. And uh, this is from our audience, from our family members. Michael Chaney says, show me what you know. I like that. Tiffany Catron. Uh, she's getting love from you. Get, you all are getting love from the audience. Um, Yaja Pren, uh, Printour. I'm not quite sure. Yaja, um, let me know what you mean by that. And then nuggets of fairness from Ms. Catron. And I have to agree, um, you know, Ms. Catron, you are certainly speaking um, probably the best practices for how to engage multiple styles of learning for our students. And uh, you are one of many, but there are quite a few that are not engaging um, in such a way. Ms. Cornish, I have two questions for you. The first one is as a parent, do you feel pressure 
um, to have your, your, your children uh, perform, um, it, 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 is, is the pressure, I guess, is the pressure different now that it's virtual learning for them in terms of securing those grades? Or is it about the same for you as, as a parent? Like, are you on them harder? <laughs> um, <laughs> I have to be honest and say yes. Tell the truth, Ms. Cordes, tell the truth. Uh, very much true. Uh, my oldest, who is a fifth grader, um, I tell her like I, the same way that I am with you now is the same way I was with my fifth graders because I taught fifth grade for two years. So, um, and I remember them telling me like, I hate you. I'm like, all right, well, hate me when you get to the sixth grade. <laughs> okay. Um, but yes, I feel it is much harder because I am the teacher now. You know, um, I am their primary teacher. Um, you know, not to say that, you know, their, their, their teacher isn't face to face with them every day, but I actually can see what they are producing. Um, I, I have a fifth grader who, um, you know, she, she's, she's good. Like she is well enough where, well, in the beginning it was tough because I had to help her learn how to use her voice and speak up for what she needed. Um, instead of me having to be the one to hover. You know, I still do, but I do it less. But I needed her to speak up for what she needed because, you know, if I'm not listening at the moment to say, oh, okay, well, hey, you know, you're working on, and I hate fractions, you're working on fractions, that's just not my, M my MD, but I can see across the room, are you working? Are you focused? You know, are you paying attention to what your teacher is saying? But if there's a question around content, I need you to be able to speak up. My twins who are in kindergarten, it's a whole nother level. Like if I, if they're writing the letter B and one of them is writing letter D, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to sit there and not tell them to, you know, fix it, you know, but if the teacher can't see it, if the teacher can't help them manipulate it with their hands, you know, it is. So I do feel more pressured because um, I want them to really show what they can do. And because physically their teacher can't see exactly what they're doing or how they're doing it, um, you know, it does cause, you know, me to want to give my input more, you know? So when I do see, you know, a, 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 a classroom grade or, I mean, a, a graded assignment and I'm like, yeah, she knows that, you know, I don't know, you know, um, I mean, you know, like, you know, like Ms. Katron said, you know, you can voice it, you can write it, you can show it up in a picture. Um, I, like I said, I have twins. One is more vocal than the other. You know, the, 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 vocal, the vocal twin, he can talk up a storm and tell you everything about a book. The other one, she just, you know, it takes her a lot longer. So there's not that time really, you know, in that virtual setting to give her, you know, it's not that one-on-one -on -one there. So um, I, I do, I do believe I'm, I'm much harder on them because I mean, and I'm gonna be honest, I see it now. I see what they're being graded on. I actually could see the work versus, you know, before it was, you know, um, yeah, you could see it in their books or for the most part, you saw it when you got the report card, really, right? You know, you just saw, okay, they got the I or the P or the E or the G, but now I'm actually seeing their fruits of their labor. I'm seeing when she's frustrated with fractions and I have no idea how to help her. You know, I see it when, you know, they can't sit for that 20 minute period and I got to coach them on, you know, hey, you know, I need you to pay attention. I need you to pay attention, you know, hoping that the teacher gives them a break in, you know, in a couple of seconds, you know. So I think for me as a parent, um, I'm really there to really just coach them and help them. So you know, when you do see the end result, sometimes, you know, I think it is frustrating for a parent, like, well, what do I do? What else can I do? Um, especially when you, yeah, I can voice my opinions, you know, but at the same time, I don't physically have a partner in this to really grasp what it is that the, the kids are doing at the moment. All right, thank you. And going to our, our chat from our parents, um, Yaja, I am so sorry. Printor is your last name. Thank you, Yaja. Um, I want to get to Rebecca's question, but first I'm going to jump to Michael. Michael Cheney writes, that's right, Mrs. Cornish. Uh, that's what real parents and teachers are supposed to stay when your own children 
and your children in the classroom. Also, you're trying, I'm assuming he means you're trying to get them ready for the real world. Um, thank you, Michael, uh, for continuing to write in. Uh, Rebecca's question is, uh, I have heard that parents helping out is a bit of a problem. I'm, I'm gonna ask you this, Ms. Catron. Um, what's the line between helping and making sure that they get it right? So helicopter, well, it's not, it's not a helicopter parent anymore, it's a virtual chapter, a chopper uh, parent now. Uh, wh what do you say to that, Ms. Catron? Well, it's the appreciated parents, number one. Um, for any parents who are listening or who listen, um, even if you are an educator, thank you. Um, it, it's it's really hard. It's hard to juggle all of this. So I, I'm teaching virtually with other children of my own at home learning at the same time. So I can see it from both perspectives. Um, however, I'm helping my children from home as a teacher. So I have the knowledge how to be a teacher not all of our parents went to school to be teachers, so they're doing the best that they can. So um, a, a immense amount of appreciation. Um, it's hard and we would not be able to do this right now without parents, hands down. Um, yes, at this point, you're right, Ms. Cornish, they can, they can let go a little bit and let the kids kind of flourish a little bit more. They're getting the, you know, the different platforms and all of that, but um, there is a line between helping and hurting. Um, I'm not quite sure how it was phrased in the original question. Um, I've had parents literally, we've had to give assessments still that we would give in person um, to capture that beginning of the year data to see where students are. We've still had to give those virtually. It's hard enough in person, but virtually um, I've had a parent stand over the shoulder of a child and I just try to keep reminding, um, remember, don't help your student with this assessment because it's just giving me a baseline of information. I'm not grading your son or daughter on this. I just need to know kind of what they know. I need to know how that I can help them. Um, what do I need to do next? How, you know, how can I kind of make ends meet? Um, and the parent actually was very frustrated and voiced that over Zoom with all of the students there. Um, <laughs> and it was, I understood though, because I'm also a parent and I know that my daughter who's also in first grade and I teach first grade had to take the same assessment and I know how hard it was for her. And I also look at my own students no different than I look at my own kids in terms of what I want for them. And um, it's frustrating even seeing my students who, who do struggle sometimes with those things. Um, so giving the answers is, it's sometimes the natural way that we want to help as a parent, but that's not actually helping. We have to like teach them to learn to think for themselves. And that's hard. It's hard to do when you haven't really been trained how to phrase questions right. Um, so I don't want to bash anybody for doing that. However, there is a fine line between helping the child, helping them think and process uh, whatever it is, the math problem, the reading, the question, um, the thought, process it on their own while kind of helping them and coaching them along. Some of our kids are, are pretty independent and they can do those things alone and other of our kids need a little bit more um, from us. And that's from the teacher's perspective or even the parent perspective. But um, looking at it from both a parent and teacher perspective. Yeah, we just have to be conscientious of that because it can hurt. I've had a lot of skewed data because of parents just giving answers. So I had a student who um, whose data showed that they're at like a second grade level and they're in the first grade. However, when they're showing me the classwork, those things don't align. So if we connect that all the way back to grading, data could always be skewed, even in person without the parent right there giving the answers. So is that all that we look at? No. So I think that just is kind of a connection there. Thank you. And you know, you made a, a great segue. Ms. Cornish talked about being able to physically see where the hard work that the, her children are doing is leading to in terms of grades as she's now essentially sharing or co-teaching uh, her children in the classroom. Ms. Katron, I'm gonna ask you a quick follow-up before we go back to the chat. And that is, what are the grade, what, what is really being graded? Like with, you know, all the different protocols and percentages, you know, does it, does it make sense? Is, is there a better way um, for grading, you know, or, or 
How do those things measure up? So um, when kind of thinking about my thoughts before joining the discussion tonight, I really realized that I don't really sway one way or the other with this because it's, it's hard. It's a hard, it's like you're between a rock and a hard place. I wanna say number one, transparency matters. So if you're an educator who's listening, an administrator who's listening, a curriculum developer, whoever, transparency is key because our parents need to understand our curriculum. They need to understand the common core state standards. They need to understand by the end of this grade, your child needs to master these things. I might not understand the language of the common core state standards, but if you give me a quick, simple, hey, my child needs to know these six things in totality by the end of the year, that's going to help me at home, help my child with homework, help them study if we're still virtual. Um, so that transparency is key. The second piece, we look at the grading system, whether it be criterion reference, whether it be norm referenced grading, um, mastery based grading, however you do it, we look at it from the angle and the lens of how is the child performing? Did they master this? Do they know this? Is my child behind? My child is really smart. That's not the totality of the lens of grading. We've forgotten something. Where is the teacher's role in this? Is my grading helping me be reflective of my practice? Um, meaning, am, am I going to reteach this particular lesson to my students because so many of them didn't do well? Or am I gonna pull that small chunk of kids who need to master this skill and they're not quite there yet? How am I gonna approach that? Because clearly the first time I taught it, something was amiss. Stop looking at only the kids and what they're scoring or what they performed on this worksheet as the totality of the grade. The grade is also indicative of us as educators. So is there a better way to do this? That's like a hot topic, right? Um, yes, there's a better way to do it. What is that? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know it's gonna start with those two, transparency, reflection on the teaching practice. And the third one is what I've been talking about all along is looking at the whole child, not just the skills, not just the worksheet, not just the test, but what else are they showing me that they know? And if we can connect those three pieces to someone who gets paid a lot of money to develop these ideas, then maybe we have an answer. Um, I don't fully have an answer, but I think that those components are part of it. Thank you, Ms. Catron. Ms. Cornish, we're coming to you in a moment. Let me just get to our faithful few that are in the chat. Let's see. Um, Ms. Cornish, you are being a responsible parent. Kudos. A lot of parents are erasing their kids' work when there are errors and writing the work uh, for them. Uh, so the children are not learning, to your point, Ms. Catron. Uh, Yasha Printour says, Ms. Catron, some of these parents be doing the most. Uh, like you said, you can see them on the side of the screen, giving them answers and pointing to the pictures. So a point of agreement there from Yasha. Uh, Patrick Henderson, welcome, Patrick, sa asks, would teachers appreciate the right to grade parents? Uh, I'm not going to answer that. Um, I'll let Ms. Catron if she, if she so feels, or Ms. Corners if she so feels. Would um, we grade grade the parents? That's, <laughs> yeah. Well, would you appreciate, would you like to uh, grade the parents? No, because I wouldn't want to be graded as a parent. <laughs> That's very <laughs> diplomatic. Very, it, very diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> um, Let's see, Rebecca asks, as a parent, I would like more information on the goals for the year, which Ms. Catron, that's exactly what you um, uh, outlined for us. Are teachers supposed to be sharing that info with parents or do we need to ask for that info? Thank you, Rebecca, because, you know, Ms. Cornish, you alluded to that early. If you didn't look on that website, you would not have a clue. Part of that is, as you stated, uh, to lead us off, Ms. Cornish, there is no uniformity besides the percentages uh, of how grading is supposed to um, take place. Um, so, so what do you think, um, 
how do you feel about that, Ms. Cornish? Would you like to see the expectations uh, for your parent, I mean, for your child be handed down to you at the top of the year, middle of the year, end of the year? Yeah. Um, I, I, I would agree. Um, you want to know early on what the expectations are. You know, I think that that's, you know, I'm going to be honest, in any relationship that you are in, and I, if, if the parents are out there listening, you are in a relationship with your teacher. <laughs> You are. Um, it is a partnership between you and your child's teacher for as long as your child is in school. And, um, you know, there are some great relationships there, so not great relationships, you know, but as adults, we know that it is not, you know, it, it's, it's no longer about us, it's about our children. So we have to make every effort to figure out how do I work with this person, uh, work with this teacher. So uh, work with this parent. So, you know, for me, um, it, it is important. The same way as we go to the doctors, you know, to do their well visits, you know, the doctor will give you the developmental schedule of, you know, where your child should be. He's gonna ask you, or she's gonna ask you those questions. Is he walking? What, is he doing this? Is he doing that? That's the same thing that you wanna know from your teacher. So, you know, it is just imperative as a parent Yes, it would be great if it all this stuff was handed to us and, you know, we, you know, but if it's not, you know, you as a parent have to advocate not only for your children, but you're advocating for the partnership that you know that you have to do for your for your child. So, um, you know, you have you, you still have teachers in this day who, you know, even for myself, who use the old school Dutch Dutch uh, word list and, you know, all of those little things that, you know, we're even used to using, but it, it's, it's, still, it's still a perspective, you know, it may be different from what we're used to now, but again, what are those high frequency words that, you know, we learned then that we should be learning now, you know, um, if it is a lot, if Common Core is a lot, flashcards are still in place, you can go to uh, what is it called? Uh, the dollar store and get those same flashcards, you know, the colors, the shapes, the numbers. So, you know, even if it is overwhelming, even if it is a lot, you know, I think as parents, though, there are small things that we can do to keep our kids in that same mindset of learning and understanding that this keeps going on. Um, but yes, I would say number one is understanding that you are in a relationship with your teacher. You know, if it is not if you don't have their cell phone, you know, if you don't have their whatever, a way to communicate them, that's just number one. And just talk about what do you see? Um, you know, I'll often send text messages to my, uh, to my, uh, to the, my child's teacher, just saying, how was their week? You know, because I think for me, I, I'm one of the parents that I work from home. So there are some days where I may not have a lot on my plate and I can be more into what they're doing, but there are some days that I can't. So those days that I can't, you know, how did she do today? How did he do today? Or if I didn't get to him, you know, daily, how did, how did they do this week? You know, and just opening the lines of communication to say, okay, he did great on this. She did great on that. Here's something that, you know, you may want to try. Here's this something that you may want to do. Um, but I think keeping the lines of communication is definitely key. Um, you know, just to speak to that, you know, wit and wisdom, Eureka, they all have parent tip sheets. So if the teachers haven't given it to you, you can find it on the NSYNC. Um, that's one of the apps on Clever. You can go into NSYNC, you can look at the parent tips and you can see what they're doing for module one. You can see what they're doing for module two. Um, you know, it, 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 and, and it will take a little bit of your own personal time doing your own research. What should my fifth grader be able to do? What should my nine-year-old be able to do? Um, you know, if, if that is what you're interested in. Wow, thank you. We got nuggets from Ms. Cornish. We got resources from Ms. Cornish. Tyrone, if you're at home, man, we got nuggets going. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Cornish, I'm going to have you answer this on the other side of me going back to the chat. But the question to you is, what is there something that grades don't always capture when, when your child is in the learning process? And you may say, oh man, I wish I wish the teacher, no, they didn't get an A on that, but I wish the teacher could have gotten this. So think about that. And let me go into the chat if you would. 
Uh, let's see. Michael Cheney says, you're right, Yaja. Uh, we have special needs parents uh, that help the child while on Zoom. Uh, Yaja says, transparency is key. Knowing what is expected should be concrete. Sheldon Allen, welcome Sheldon, says helping parents understand what is expected and their students' learning journey is more important than ever. And then Rebecca, I can I can answer this one, Rebecca. Um, and, and why is it not mandated that learning goals be shared of all the things that need to be mandated? Um, Ms. Cornish, we'll go back to you. What about that? Like, are there things that grades don't always capture? Um, definitely. Um, you know, what I have been told in, in the time that I have been a parent um, is that you are your child's first teacher. Um, they learn from you from the day that you have them. Um, and you know your child more than better than anyone. Um, the, the struggle, and I am a, a parent who has a child with special needs, um, to see them struggle um, has been difficult to know that I've been in situations where the teachers did not understand my child was even more difficult. So I had to rally around those who were willing and I even had to open myself up to say, if they're willing to help you help me, then I need to let them in. Um, so I think when we get into this idea of, you know what they can do and they may not necessarily have performed it the way that the teacher expected them to perform it. I think here is where, and I still struggle with this as a parent, um, in a relationship with the teacher is how do I provide my voice and am I okay? Should I, should I feel comfortable voicing, you know, my perspective of my child to the teacher? And sometimes that's hard for a lot of parents, you know, whether they feel that it may be a confrontation, whether they may feel like, you know, the teacher isn't listening or, you know, or I'm too overbearing or I'm a helicopter mom. But I feel like if I don't, then I've done a disadvantage to my own child. Um, and it's also a level of, I've, now, like I said, I've had to teach my oldest how to now be able to advocate for herself. You know, when she came home, I probably stay in third grade and said, mommy, I didn't get my, I didn't get my frequent break today. Oh, okay. All right. So I felt like, you know, it was kind of like a kudos on my back because like now she knows that she's supposed to get her frequent breaks, you know? So, you know, now it is a conversation with the teacher to say, look, just letting you know, you know, she came home, she said she didn't get a break today. You know, maybe it's just a drop to say, you know, that's a part of her IEP, you know, bam, you know, and it went on, you know, as if, you know, nothing happened. Um, but I, I, I do believe that I think as parents, um, not to say that, you know, the, and I've been there, you know, not to say that the teacher knows everything, um, but we can't be um, scared not to communicate with that teacher about what they see their child either flourishing with or struggling with. You know, my child can sit here and perform a whole play on her own, you know, but when it comes to fractions, it's just, it's not gonna happen. But, you know, hey, you tell her that she has to develop a rat for fractions, I guarantee you she's going to perform, you know, like no one's business. Um, so do I say to the teacher, hey, you know, is there an opportunity where she could try this or watch this video or, you know, do something else? Um, it's, it, you shouldn't be fearful to ask, even if the teacher says no, okay, I get it, you know, um, maybe with the explanation, I'll understand it more. But I think that at least you should ask. Thank you. Next question is for both of you. Uh, Ms. Katron, I'll come to you first. What's ideal in terms of grading? You know, is the system that we currently have ideal in your mindset, or is there something different or better that can be done? And, and uh, Ms. Cornish, I'll come to you after Ms. Katron. So, um, the reliability of the grading system as we've been hearing through and through it just is it, 
it's not uniform and it's kind of, I feel like some educators feel boxed in and they're afraid to step outside of that box. So that kind of curtails off of what Ms. Cornish was just describing. Um, if I come to you and I ask you if my child, I know my child and I know that they can express, <coughs> excuse me, they're learning in this way, they're not grasping it the way that you've presented. Um, no teachers don't know everything. Um, are teachers afraid? Yes, I think a lot of them are. Um, you, you run into some who aren't. I think teachers are afraid to kind of step out of that norm. They're kind of trained in a political system where, um, where our hands are tied underneath of these assessments, um, all of these things that are polit politically tied, um, these high stakes assessments and all this and that. So there's teachers that are afraid to step outside of the box and to try these new things. However, we're in an age now in education where if you're afraid to step outside of the box as an educator to even expose your students to new ways to learn, expose your students and your personal children how to advocate for their learning um, and, and, and to show these different ways of um, like being able to to exhibit to me how you know something, then we're going in a bad direction. Uh, we need to be able to be afraid to fight against some of the norms in our systems and to, to allow our students to do this because I know that I have, I have to get to know my students first. So I do individualized meetings and I structure individualized learning plans for each student. I don't care if there's 35 of them or whatever. I need to know each person. And that also comes in that relationship with the parent um, to get to know that child. Um, how, how can I best draw this learning out of you? How can I best um, give you this lesson? What can I incorporate in how I would already teach it to help you? So, um, I just think that we need to, to cater our teaching and our education systems now more towards the learners. There, there are problems with the grading system. Um, at the end of the day, are we asking ourselves, what, what do we want our kids to be focused on? Are these valid measures of success? Um, and grades should be valid measures of success. My son's not a great writer. Will he ever be? I don't know. He's great at math. Just like Miss Cornish said, her daughter more thematic, more into the, the poetic side. Will she ever be great at math? Do we not want to push them? Yeah, we still want to push them and we still want them to learn, but we also need to start zeroing in on what people are great at and stop focusing on what we think inside of this box that they should have to know. Um, yes, we have to expose them to all of these categories and all of these things. Um, but let's start to look at the learner for who the learner is. Um, so there are there are problems with the grading system um, and what we grade. If you're telling me that a kindergarten, a first grader, I don't care what grade they're in, that 70% of their grade is falling on these assessments I give, raise your hand if you're a poor test taker. <laughs> that answer's enough, right? Uh, ner you know, it, it, so that's a problem in itself. Thank you for creating this, um, you know, the scales, but what are the scales actually measuring? And I want to know that my students, my personal children, my babies in my classroom, whoever it is, that they're being measured on success, that I'm setting them up for success. We have universities now that aren't even fully looking at the grading scales that are ages old. I mean, we're talking the, the letter grades and the, the percentages what started becoming popular in the 40s. We're in 2020 now. So um, we have universities now that are looking at the whole package, not just the grades and the GPA, but did your student participate in sports? Did they reach out in the community? Were they active in other roles? We should be starting that early as soon as they start school. And that should be throughout. So yeah, there are lots of holes and, and lots of problems. Thank you, Ms. Catron. Uh, Ms. Cornish, it sounds like you will end up having final thoughts, but if you could give us, you know, your ideal way of grading, um, you know, as a parent, you you have the, the luxury of being a parent, but also an educator as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, I think for me, um, and I, I think, I, I do believe, and I, and I know it's a struggle, um, and the struggle is real, real here in Baltimore, um, you know, is that we don't have the, as much organized parent involvement as we would like. Um, so I would say that for me, what grading, I would want grading to look like is that you have involved the parent in every aspect. Um, when, you know, when, when this, when this policy came into place, well, what any, what any other additional policy comes into place, have you considered, excuse me, have you considered what the parent feels, how the parent, you know, understands um, me being a former administrator, I would sit in IEP meetings sometimes and I would adamantly tell my parents, if you don't understand something, I need you to communicate that. And I even told my teachers, you have to communicate this information in the way that that parent understands, you know? So I think it's an idea that, you know, it's not just you know, so much what I, I believe sitting at this particular table, what it should be. Um, it is getting the perspective of all parents. Um, it is getting the perspective when it's, when it does come time for grading, you know, um, again, it's also that relationship. I have a relationship with my teachers, my daughter's teacher, who we have conversations about her grading. She tells me what she sees on her end. I tell her what I see on my end you know, that to me, you know, is the best policy, I think, when it comes to any, any policy. And when it does come down to the student, you know, it is not a one sided, you know, here's the report card from the teacher, you know, and that's it. You know, even when we're out here in our professional worlds, we have some of us have more than one supervisor as teachers teachers, how many, you know, you're, you're observed by two different administrators. So you're even getting two points of view then, you know? So I think that if, I think as a schools, as stakeholders, if we begin to not just involve, you know, each of, of us on that, that, at that table and invite the parent in, I think that we will really begin to see the idea of a whole child compel because the whole child does mean the parent, you know? So nuggets, 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 family. A um, few more minutes. I want to last. Sorry, folks, I muted myself by accident. Last couple of thoughts. Um, Yaja says grades are not reflective of any social emotional stresses that impact grades. Absolutely. Children's learning is also impacted by just lost that impacted by peer to peer comparison. Children need to be uh, given the concept of individuality within the group. Uh, Sheldon Allen says, as a white privileged parent who is able to be more involved in supporting my child's learning, I find it hard to judge how and how much to communicate with teachers. I don't wanna to be too demanding when teachers may feel overwhelmed and may need to prioritize families with tougher situations than my own. But I also want to know how to best support my child um, Tiffany got your note there. All stakeholders in the child's education should have a respective voice. Thank you. Uh, Keisha Goodwin says educators and parents were against the 70% assessments. We expressed the opposition during public forums. Also, we said it should not include district and state testing. Keisha Goodwin, thank you for your comments. Also, thank you for joining us on the show. Um, Ms. Tiffany Catron, Ms. Linnea Cornish, thank you so much uh, for your expertise. Both of you, parents, both of you, educators, both of you way outside the box on how the child be their parent or, um, I mean, how the child be their student or your own children should be educated. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us today. Family, once again, join us on Thursday, five o'clock at Tyrone's house. We pray that Tyrone will be back to his normal, vibrant, intelligent, outgoing, and outrageous self on Thursday's show at Tyrone's house. Uh, please keep him in your prayers, not feeling the greatest. Uh, but thank you all so much for joining in. All of you that hit the chat up, thank you for helping me to facilitate this conversation without Tyrone. 
Uh, it is quite a task, even though we have wonderful esteemed guests, your impact really make the show go. So thank you all very much. Have a great evening. Be safe. Follow the safety protocols, speaking of protocols. Get a good grade on doing well according to this virus. All right, family, thank you so much. See you next thank Monday. You.